Second Chronicles chapter 6 Then said Solomon, The Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. Now thick darkness was where the most holy place was, because that's not where the candlesticks were. There was no light in the most holy place. Even outer space has got light, stars, uh, the sun. They say there's other suns out there. Uh, there's beautiful clusters of light that man can't see unless, you know, the spaceships and the telescopes we got. So it's got to be talking about that holy place, the most holy place. But I have built a house of habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. Now, Solomon is talking about the temple and that thick darkness. I don't know. Yeah, like I said, if you were to ask me, I would say it would be the most holy place because there's light in outer space and heaven, you know, heaven's not dark. And the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has with his hands fulfilled that which he spake with his mouth to my father David. Alright, he's going to quote what God said to David. What God says is going to happen will happen. God is not and will never be a liar. Notice the congregation stands as some is now going to give his sermon. That's been the practice of the old church in New England, and I'm not sure the uh, England itself, was you stood during the church services, the whole church service. Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in. All right, from from the Exodus to now, God has not chosen one place. That ark has been in different places, different cities, been different homes, but God has never called those places. To now, He's called Jerusalem, and He kept telling them during Moses' time, the place there where I put my name, the place where I put my name. The place where I put my name. Here is the place. Jerusalem. That my name might be there. The Jews were to be a light. To the world. This was supposed to be a spectacular building. Of all the spectacular buildings. Because all the people. All the caravans. All the travelers were to be passing through this land. And say. What's so special about that place? And then you have the testimonies of what the Jews, uh, that God has done for them. The parting of the Red Sea. All the miracles that he's done in Egypt. The feeding of the 40 years of just manna. Their shoes never uh, rotted. Their feet never swelled. How they got all the victories. Like the big victory of Jericho. They just marched around the city. And these people were to come, who were coming to the land, like the Queen of uh, Sheba, like the Ethiopian eunuch later in the book of Acts, they had to come to this land and say, okay, what is it about your God? What do I do for your God? Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. Now you remember, Israel during Samuel's time wanted a leader. They wanted a king like all the nations. God did not want Saul. God did not want a king. He was to be king. The people did not want that. Like I said in America, <coughs> if you check the history, which I was even stunned, no American revival took part when we had a president. They were all preceding George Washington. And as far as I saw, and I could, if somebody shows me where I'm wrong, but a true, definite, scriptural, biblical uh, revival, national, ever took place after a president, 
show me with the dates and time and the evidence. I want evidence. As far as I know, we've only had one Baptist president. Then God chose David to be king. Then God chose Solomon. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. All right, get that. Jerusalem is where God is to be. Jerusalem is where Jesus Christ will sit on the, on the throne of David to reign in the millennium. That my name might be there. And have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And David will be king over Israel. Prince. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And it's true. David saw that his own uh, greatness of his home, and he realized that God was just living in intent. And he spoke one day to one of his prophets, Gad or Nathan, I forget which one. He says, you know what? Why does God dwell in that tent and I dwell in, in cedar? That is wrong. Now, uh, in our Christian walk, our Christian life, we should realize one day that why do I have all this and what does God get in return? And David is never rebuked for his love for the Lord to build a temple. Never. But the Lord said to David, my father, for as much as it was in thy heart to build a house for my name, Thou didst well in that it was in thy heart. There's no rebuke. I want to get into something that uh, next verse, but let's let's get where we are right now. God saw David's heart and said, "You know what? I like that." Now we get today a lot of people think the church and all that is the wood, the the bricks, the stones, the rocks, the nails, and Everything else to have you. And that's not the church. You know how you please God today is when you say your home. Okay, the wood, the stone. Your home meaning you. Your home meaning your wife. Your home meaning your children. Your home meaning everything to do with your home. Everything. You say, you know what? I'm going to give it to God. That's what pleases God. A lot of people won't do that because you know what? They'll be afraid that God may take them up on the offer. But this is a motive. Motive is an important thing in the Bible. Especially heart motive. You can say anything you want with your lips, but what is your heart? And realize only God, Satan, and you know what your heart's thinking. There's a lot of deceivers out there. And 2 John speaks about deceivers. Paul writes about uh, the, the ministers of Satan. It's all motive. Notwithstanding, thou shalt not build the house. But this, thy son, which shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house of my, of my name. Okay, I'm just reading a little bit here so you can see how much it tells you. David could not build a house because he was a man that shed blood of wartime and Uriah. Now, we're not rebuking David's love for the Lord, but the fact is, David couldn't do it because he shed blood. Shall we jump over to the New Testament? Name me one man who built many churches that shed blood. Apostle Paul. He was there at Stephen's death, the Bible records. He was hauling Christians off left and right off the prison. But you know what kind of life he had? You know the bruises and problems he went through? He reaped what he sowed. But he built churches. 
God still used David. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Don't go put limitations on man that God don't put on man. But for whatever reason, God would not allow David to do it because of the blood that was upon his hands. So what's he say? The son which shall come forth from his loins. So he told David this before Solomon was born. Gee, that runs in the, in the line of Isaac. Was told before he was born. Samson was, was told before he was born. Rebekah went to the Lord before Esau and Jacob were born. John the Baptist was pre-told before he was born. You look at all those babies that were told and named before they were born, and you see the type of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to build an excellent temple. He said that in John 14. I go prepare a place for you. I'm going to go build a mansion. Now, if you speak of the beauty of what Solomon did here with all the resources, you imagine what the God of all creation that said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. You imagine what he's going to build for us? Have you really studied the revelation of all those stones in New Jerusalem? And not sunlight, but God's pure light reflecting or, uh, or transparent through all that crystal, all that, that those colors. You need new eyeballs. You need a new body. That'd blow you, you right away. So Solomon turns out to be a type of Jesus Christ. The Lord therefore has performed his word that he has spoken. Well, God is true and faithful. Now listen, man, I mean, he could say something and not knowingly be able to back it up. I might tell somebody, Monday, I'll, I'll blah, blah, whatever. Well, guess what? Something could come in where I can't do what I said on Monday. But if God said it, if God said, I'm coming back to get you, I'm coming back to receive you, I'm coming back to take you home. You better mark your word. It may be 2013 years, but God is going to send Jesus Christ to come and get us. And that's one of the characteristics of the church age before the Lord does come. They're going to be saying, delaying, and oh, he's not coming. Where I believe Peter or Paul, one of them spoke about, there was a church saying that Jesus Christ already came. I think that's in the book of Acts. I'm not sure about that. But there was people out there saying that Jesus already came. Now we're in a church. Well, he's not going to come because he hasn't come yet. Don't give up. God will do what he says. For I am risen up in the room of David my father. And am set on the throne of Israel. As the Lord promised. And have built the house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Now that throne is very important. You can't say that's the throne David sat on because Solomon's going to build an ivory throne and he's going to overlay it with, with gold. He's going to have six steps and there's going to be lions on his. That's not the kind of throne it's talking about. It's talking about the establishment of David, the man, the king that God wanted. And you could put a high chair there and have the king sit. And that's because some of those kings are young, they're babies. But it's the position that God put David in. That's what they mean by the throne. It's the authority. It's the kingship. Listen, Jesus Christ is told he's going to sit on the throne of David. Now that, that throne of David is not going to mysteriously appear. Boy, there it is. David's going to look, hey, that's my throne. No, it's not. That means the, the seat, the authority of David. The true king of Israel. And in it have I put the ark, wherein is the covenant of the Lord, that would be the law, Ten Commandments, the five books of Moses, that he made with the children of Israel. 
And he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands. And this is where you get the people they put their the hands out right. Is it wrong? Is it right? If God led you to do it, do it. But if you're part of this religious group, you know, all that other junk, and, and it's just show, it's just flesh. There's two motives. You do it for the Lord or you do it for the flesh. Solomon's doing it for the Lord. For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold. And you see those on buildings today where they're working on very high places. Brazen, judgment, brass. Of five cubits long and five cubits broad and three cubits high. Now why did God want you to know that? Why are some things in the Bible just a mystery and God talks about this brazen scalping and he gives you the exact dimensions of it? I have no idea. But it's something for God to record. It's something important. The Bible says every word. That includes that brazen uh, scalping. And had set it up in the midst of the court, and upon it he stood and kneeled down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he's going to pray. And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in the heaven. There are gods out there. Satan is a god of this world. But there is no God like God, nor in the earth. Well, there's deceivers, there's devils running around the earth, especially in the time of Jesus. But there is one God, which keepeth covenant, God won't lie, won't break a promise, and showeth mercy unto his, thy servants. Satan never shows mercy. That walk before thee with all thy heart, all their hearts. Thou which has kept with thy servant David my father, that which thou hast promised him, and spake it with thy mouth, and hast fulfilled it with thy hand, it is this day. Everything that God told David about that temple is now happening. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father, that which thou hast promised him, saying, there shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel. You say, well, there's no king in Israel today. No, they rejected him. Can you really say, this verse here says, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel. Is that a true statement? You know there's no king there today. No. Jesus Christ is the king of Israel, and God is looking at him, sitting at the right hand of him. God is still staring at the king of Israel. They just don't want him. He said, what about all those years that they were without a king? Because they didn't want to do what God wanted to do. They disobeyed and rebelled against God. Yet so that thy children take heed to their way to walk in my law, see, as thou hast walked before me. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified, which thou hast spoken unto thy servant David. Notice David becomes a servant as a king. Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant, and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee. Solomon is calling himself a servant. And he's king. That thy eyes may be open upon this house day and night. Upon the place whereof thou hast said, 
that thou wouldest put thy name there, to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth forward toward this place. Now you think God's eyes are closed to Jerusalem today? No. He sees everything going on. And he's unhappy with what his people are doing. He's unhappy that they're still rebelling against him. God never shuts his eyes. I know what some people say, but when Jesus closed his eyes on the boat, the storms came up. Well, that's a proven fact. It's recorded. We don't have a God that sleeps. Hearken therefore unto thy supplications of thy servant and of thy people Israel, which they shall make toward this place. Hear thou from thy dwelling place, even from heaven, and when thou hearest, forgive. Now, the Jews were to play, pray towards Jerusalem, wherever they were. This is where the, the Muslims, Islam, and all the Asian uh, religions get to, you know, we have to pray towards the east, we have to pray towards the north. This is where they get the idea. It comes out of the Bible. But they're worshiping and praying to a false god and not the god of the Bible. We Christians are not told to pray in a particular position. Because the Bible says Christians are seated in heavenly places. We are in heaven. We are before God. Our bodies hasn't made it yet. If a man sin against his neighbor, and it happens... And an oath be laid upon him to make him swear. The oath come before thy altar in this house. Then hear, then hear thou from heaven and do and judge thy servants by requiting the wicked, by recompensing his way upon his own head, and by justifying the righteous, by giving him according to his righteousness. In other words, he said, listen, there's two guys and one has done fault. Go after the guy that gets fault so justice happens. That the guy who done right comes before the altar, comes before the priest and says, Listen, I got a controversy. Listen, even Jesus Christ backed this up. He says, Listen, you go to the person yourself and deal with them. And if he don't listen, you take a friend. And if he don't listen to the friend or another person in the church, then you take him before the church. So that justice and righteousness happens. If a man sin against his neighbor, and I just read that. Verse 24. And if thy people Israel be put to the worse before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplications before thee in this house, then hear thou from, from heaven, from the heavens, and forget the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again into the land which thou gavest to them and to their fathers. While we're in this land, the enemy comes. If we come into the house, into the house, and pray, Lord God, hear. Now this is not Daniel. Because Daniel couldn't come to the house. The house was destroyed by the Babylonians. While that house is there, they're in trouble. And they come to the house and they pray to God, Listen, Lord. When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee. Now this is an important verse. Yet if they pray towards his place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, when thou doest, afflict them. Then hear, from, then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants. And of thy people Israel, when thou hast taught them the good way, wherein they should walk, and send rain upon the land which thou hast given unto thy people for an inheritance. Weather is dependent upon God. Go over to the book of Job and read Job chapter 1. Weather depends on the devil. Getting permission from God. There was a whirlwind that killed Job's sons. The devil made that whirlwind with God's permission. Not only does God take care of the weather, not El Nemo, tsunamis, earthquakes, 
Lack of rain. Too much rain. It's an author by God. For what? One of the things could be because of sin. Sin may be the cause of famine and drought. America is suffering that today. How do you get right? Confess your sin. Go to the go to the God of the Bible. Confess your sin and get right. And he, Solomon says he'll give you rain. If there be dearth in the land, that's death. Nothing grows. People are dying. Animals are dying. If there be pestilence, diseases, crop failures, bugs, everything. If there be blasting or mildew, you know America has a big problem with mildew and mold. Read Numbers, was it Leviticus 13 and 14, when it talks about um, leprosy, how leprosy gets into the walls. Leviticus, I believe that is. Mold gets into the walls. And usually by the time you find out that you've got a mold problem, it's a very serious problem. Because of mold, I was diagnosed with a lung, lung disease that was going to kill me, emphysema. But there was mold growing in the home that we were in. Locusts. They'll destroy everything that's green and edible. Unless John the Baptist was around with a spoon. Or caterpillars. That would be an interesting study to study these caterpillars because they can do destruction. One of the minor prophets speaks about caterpillars. What this animal left behind, this one will come. What this one will be coming by, then caterpillars will come. And then, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people. <laughs> that, that includes the Gentiles. Or Jew, people of Israel. When everyone shall know his own, his own sore or his own grief and shall, sp uh, yeah, shall spread forth his hands in this house. They go to the temple to seek God. Then hear thou from heaven, thy dwelling place. That's where God dwells, in heaven. And forgive, and render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou only knowest the hearts of the children of men. Now you got to remember Sam, uh, Samuel. Samson's in the flesh. He doesn't completely understand what we know from all 66 about not only does God know your heart but Satan knows your heart too that they may fear thee to walk in thy ways so long as they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers listen God's saying listen go after them I mean Psalm is saying go after them do whatever it takes for them to get right. That's what Paul prayed about the man committing fornication in the church of Corinthians. He said, how wicked is that? It's not. It's better for a Christian to die today that's in sin than keep on living and lose everything if he's not going to right, get right. Rather than one year, two years, of a Christian loss than 15, 20 years of a Christian loss. Or maybe like that man in Corinthians, it got him to do right and got him back in fellowship with God. Moreover, concerning the stranger, Gentile, which is not of thy people Israel, Gentile, but has come from a far country, for thy great name's sake, and thy mighty hand, and thy stretched out arm, if they come and pray in this house, then hear thou from heaven, even from thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calls to thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name, 
and fear thee, as doeth thy people Israel, and may know that this house which I have built is called by thy name. Naaman, who had the leprosy, came to Jerusalem purposely, knowingly seeking the God of the Jews, knowing that God was going to take care of him. And he went back after talking to Elijah saying, listen, when I have to go in this house because of the king, I had the Lord part. Listen, that guy got right in the Lord. That guy did what God wanted him to do. And I think you're going to see him in heaven. If thy people go out to war against their enemies by the way that thou shalt send them, and they pray unto thee toward, they pray unto thee toward this city, which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou from heaven, hear thou from the heavens their prayers and their supplication, and maintain their cause. Now notice he didn't say in this house. They're on a battlefield somewhere. And for whatever reason, they turn towards Jerusalem and they pray from the battlefield. Solomon saying, Hear their prayers, even if they're not in Jerusalem. If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not. And you find that in Romans chapter 3. Paul quotes this. And thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies. And they carry them away, captives into a land far off or near. This is Daniel. Daniel can't go to the house. He's in Babylon. There is no more house. Yet, <coughs> if they bethink themselves in the land, <coughs> which they are carried a captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, Babylon, for Daniel. Remember he opened up the window and prayed towards Jerusalem, the Bible says? Daniel obeyed Solomon. Daniel obeyed the law. Daniel knew much. We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dwelt wickedly. And that's exactly what Daniel does. Daniel read the life of Solomon in Solomon's prayer. If they return to thee with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captive, and pray toward their, their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, and toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house which I have built for thy name, Ezra, Nehemiah. Then hear thou from heaven, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer and supplication. And maintain their cause. And forgive thy people which they have sinned against thee. Ezra, Nehemiah. Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah. All prayed and sought the Lord. And with the prayer and supplications of doing right, that's how they ended up back in the land. And even when they were back in the land, they go to the priest who, who married the wrong women. They're like, oh boy. What do they do? They confess their sin. They get right. And they first forsake their sins and do right. And God blesses them. Now, my God, let I beseech thee, thy eyes be open. And let thy ears be attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place. Now therefore arise, O Lord, God, into thy resting place. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. Let thy saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, turn not away thy face from thy anointed, the king, the priest. O Lord God, turn not away thy face. We'll try it again. O Lord God, turn not thy face of thy anointed. O Lord God, turn not away the face of thy anointed. Isn't that remarkable? You know where I'm going with that one? Because the anointed cried on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The king, 
the Messiah, the anointed. And the Bible records the heavens went dark. And look at the after the colon. Remember the mercies of David, thy servant. That's all it was about. It was about Jesus Christ. The mercies of Jesus. The mercies of David. The answered prayer. All that God told David is going to happen. Everything that's a prophet, prophecy in this book has happened. Everything that was proclaimed about Jesus Christ in the first advent has been done 100%. And you better believe everything else that has not been done yet is going to be done. There's coming a day when man will stand before the great white throne judgment and God will cast them into hell and we are told to go out there and tell them. That is the only reason why we are here today. We are here to tell people about Jesus. The ones that get saved, we are to bring up so they go tell Jesus. And we are told to live our life so people can look at us that like that temple, they will come to us and say, there is something weird about you. There is something about you. What is it that what you have? And we're going to get into a bunch of kings that are going to do wrong, are going to fail, and they're going to look just like the world. And they're going to look like Satan. And they're going to look like sins. And nobody comes to them for nothing. And we have something better than the temple. We are in heavenly places, the Bible speaks about. We are in heaven. We are the sons of God. 